Welcome to part two of the course overview module. In part one, we explored the motivations for and challenges of concurrent and network software. In this part of the module, we'll describe how patterns and frameworks help to address these challenges of concurrent and network software. This section deliberately gives a fairly high level overview of patterns and frameworks, just to make sure you have the core concepts and ideas. Later parts of the course will go into much more detail on these topics and we'll give lots more examples. So just to reflect on what we had covered at the end of part one, I talked about the demons of complexity that we face when developing various types of concurrent and network software. How are we going to slay these demons and dragons? One of the key things to do is to leverage proven software expertise. One part of the solution involves patterns. Patterns provide solutions to common problems that arise within a particular context. Once you understand patterns and you start to look around, you'll see patterns being applied in many different parts of your life. For example, in civil engineering, if you take a look at the road systems we drive on, you'll see recurring patterns many different places. You'll see cloverleaf interchanges. You'll see jug handles if you travel in New Jersey. You'll see roundabouts or traffic circles, as they're called in the United States. And these patterns arise as ways to try to reduce conflict points, make roads safer, allow traffic to move more smoothly and efficiently, and so on. We're not here to talk about civil engineering, of course. We're here to talk about software and some of the different domains or contexts in which patterns can be applied that we'll be covering include things like mobile devices, aerospace and avionics systems, automotive systems, web servers and web services, electronic trading, and so on. Some of the key things that patterns allow us to do is to help balance and resolve key software design forces. If we think back to our road example from a moment ago, how do they build the roads? What are the forces they're dealing with? Well, it's usually things like time, cost, safety, and so on, and various trade-offs among those forces. When we build software, those forces also apply as well. But there's also some other ones that are more interesting from the point of view of software. There are forces like designing software to be modular or flexible and extensible, to be reusable. And often, those forces need to be balanced and traded off against other forces, forces to make the software low latency, or high throughput, or predictable, or dependable. And patterns help us navigate through that trade-off design space. Patterns also help by capturing recurring structures and dynamics among software elements to facilitate reuse of successful designs. For example, one pattern we'll look at a number of times throughout this course is called the observer pattern. This pattern is a pattern that helps to define a one-to-many dependency between objects so that when one object changes, all its dependents are notified and updated. And we'll see that there's other patterns related to this, things like publisher subscriber. And this particular way of looking at software design helps to describe common structural roles and responsibilities of those roles, dynamic interactions and conventions of those roles and responsibilities in ways that people can learn from and apply if they're trying to solve similar problems. Historically, you had to go through the school of hard knocks, through time, uh, very time consuming and tedious trial and error to learn these successful de design approaches. And once you learned them, they were typically either locked in the heads of the experts or buried deep in the software, both of which are very costly places to, to be because people might leave, they might uh, forget what they did and so on. So what patterns help us to do is to codify this expert knowledge, these design strategies, best practices, design constraints, and so on, in a way that many other people can learn from. And nowadays, there's a very broad literature that describes patterns for lots of different things, lots of different domains. Of course, for our purposes, we're primarily interested in the domain of concurrent and network software. If you take a look at the URL at the bottom of this slide, you'll find an article that describes some of these issues in a bit more detail. Another part of the solution to try to leverage proven design experience and expertise is something called frameworks. Frameworks are sets of integrated components that collaborate to provide a reusable architecture 
for a family of related applications. And we'll see that there's a number of interesting things that frameworks do in terms of how they are structured and how they behave. One of the key defining characteristics of a framework is that it provides so-called inversion of control. So rather than an application or some software being self-directed, doing things when it wants and how it wants, instead, the framework owns the event loop or event loops. You register your objects with the framework, and when things occur that you've indicated you're interested in, the framework is responsible for detecting what's happened and then demultiplexing and dispatching the various events to your event handlers to do various kinds of work. Frameworks also provide integrated domain-specific structures and functionality. Uh, what that means is that they handle many of the common interactions, canonical control flow, architectural combinations, and so on, so that you don't have to rethink and rediscover and relearn these for each time you're trying to build a new instantiation or application of the framework. Sometimes these domains are application domains, things like social media, mobile applications, electronic trading. Other times these domains are more infrastructure domains, the underlying technologies like communication middleware to deal with networking, graphical user interfaces, various kinds of access to databases and other persistent stores. In a sense, another characteristic of a framework is they provide semi-complete applications, which means that the framework provides most of the canonical structure and behavior, and you come along and fill in your application or system or service-specific behavior via something called hook methods, which are callbacks or other types of plugins that allow you to customize and tailor the framework, which is generic, for your particular needs. This URL also provides you with additional information about frameworks and gives you pointers to other literature on the topic. So what are some of the key benefits of patterns and frameworks? Systematic software reuse. If you've done any type of programming at all, you're probably familiar with the concept of opportunistic reuse, the kind of ad hoc cutting and pasting we do when we're building a new piece of software and we remember we've got some other stuff that was along the same lines we could leverage without having to write it from scratch. While everybody has done opportunistic reuse at various points, the problem is that you end up with lots of different variants and it's not very rigorous or formalized how you actually get that reuse. So systematic reuse goes further and makes it possible for you to get more benefit from taking the time to reuse the software. There's typically one version of something that you maintain in a version controlled repository and so on. Some of the things that patterns and frameworks do is they allow us to get both design and code reuse. The design reuse allows us to match problems to relevant structures and dynamics and patterns in a domain. For example, if you were planning to develop some kind of communication middleware that we're using to be able to interact across address spaces, you might have to deal with a number of different problems. Things like portability, event handling, connection management, concurrency and synchronization and so on. And there's a range of patterns, wrapper facade, reactor, acceptor connector, half sync, half async, monitor object and so on, that help to address those challenges. And that knowledge can make you a more effective designer. But there's more than just design to being an effective software professional. It's also important to be able to reuse the code because ultimately that's what ships, that's what sells. So frameworks allow us to be able to get reuse of detailed designs and the source code. It allows us to be able to reify or instantiate proven designs that work in particular domains for particular development environments, particular languages. The great thing about patterns and frameworks is that they allow us to avoid reinventing the wheel for many of the accidental and inherent complexities of concurrent and network software. So once you take the time to understand these design roles and responsibilities, once you understand and take the time to document and implement those designs in the form of frameworks, then you don't have to go back and continually rediscover and reinvent these solutions. You can reuse them, which is very, very helpful, saves a lot of time, saves a lot of costs, provides much better quality solutions in the long run. Here are some examples of systematic software reuse we'll be focusing on in this course. One of the things we'll focus on is Android which is a pattern-oriented software stack for mobile applications and reusable services. And we'll talk a lot about Android. You'll see examples of Android applications that use patterns uh, from a number of different perspectives. 
We'll also spend some time talking about the Adaptive Communication Environment, or ACE, which is a pattern-oriented toolkit that contains portable components and frameworks that are focused on the domains of concurrent and network software. We'll also talk about something called the ACE Orb, which is an implementation of real-time object request brokers using many of the frameworks and portable components in ACE. We'll also talk about JAWS, which is a pattern-oriented, high-performance HTTP web server that uses many of the parts of ACE, the patterns, the frameworks, and so on, in order to be able to interact using web communication. But we select these particular environments for a number of reasons. Uh, they help to demonstrate patterns because they're intentionally developed to use a pattern-oriented approach, but also because they're available freely in open source form, which means you can not only understand these concepts at a distance as concepts, but you can also dive in deep, get your hands dirty, write code, look at the code, understand the roles and relationships of the software, see how the patterns express themselves in a whole variety of different ways in different programming languages. So to summarize, this course will show by example how patterns and frameworks can help do a number of things. One thing they can do is codify good software design and implementation practices. These are important because they help novices learn from experts who've taken the time to distill their experience and provide it in pattern form. Even experts can learn too. Uh, you may be an expert at networking, you may be an expert at concurrency, but you may not yet be an expert at uh, reliable fault tolerance systems or databases or user interfaces. And so patterns can help you learn new things to make your expertise broader, and they can also provide a way to deepen the expertise that you already have by learning nuances and alternatives and perspectives that you may not have understood through your previous experience. Patterns also give explicit and intuitive names for common design structure. Going back to our example from before, the observer pattern. Once you understand this pattern, once you understand the notion of subjects and observers and these canonical interactions and dependencies and, and relationships that they have, when you communicate with your colleagues, you'll be much more expressive and much more concise at explaining exactly what you're thinking about your design. Without patterns, we'd have to talk about things with lots of low-level implementation details. We'd say stuff like, remember that design where we, where we had a linked list, or maybe it was an array, and I think we had pointers to functions, or maybe they were object subclasses we called virtual functions. I, I don't quite remember. By the time you try to get all those things out to your colleagues, they will have gotten confused and missed the point. If you know the observer pattern, if they know the observer pattern, you can say, to address this particular design challenge, let's use an observer. And then you can have a, dis a discussion as to whether that's the appropriate design structure and behavior to apply to meet your needs. Patterns can also be effective to capture and preserve design and implementation knowledge. It's almost a cliche that people read software many more times than it's written. And oftentimes, we don't do a very good job of documenting the intent of our implementations. And therefore, when people go back to try to enhance, evolve, sustain the code, they have to spend a lot of time reverse engineering these interactions by reading source code, which is a very tedious and error-prone and costly thing to do. So by documenting your software designs in the form of patterns, it helps people much more rapidly understand not only what your software does, but why it does it the way it does. And patterns help to motivate the reasons behind that. We've used patterns and pattern languages, as we'll talk about later, for many different things in the software we've developed. And it's helped us be much more productive at much lower cost that would have been in the case if everybody had to go and understand the software anew and afresh each time they did anything with it. And lastly, patterns help to, and frameworks help to facilitate restructuring and refactoring. Despite our best efforts and intentions, the world tends to change. Things evolve, new requirements come along, new platforms are introduced, new hardware, new constraints. In fact, one of the marks of success of a software project is that you have users who want it to do new and different things because they like what you have and would like you to add more. Uh, I learned those lessons very early on in my career. When I was first a professor, I was working with a company that was doing some medical imaging software and they happened to choose the ACE environment because they were developing their software on a couple of different versions of Unix. And we wanted to be able to make it possible to use the patterns and components and frameworks within ACE to simplify their application 
and a higher level services design. Well, about six months into the project, they came and said, uh, guess what? We just discovered that management has decided we're moving from Unix to Windows NT. And henceforth, we're going to have to do everything in Windows. Can you support that? Well, we didn't quite know a lot about Windows at that point, but we knew a lot about patterns and we knew a lot about frameworks. And it turned out, because we'd abstracted the software effectively and we documented the way in things which worked, it wasn't too hard for us to take ACE, port it to Windows, and then be able to take the bulk of their applications and services and port them unchanged from Unix to Windows NT, which was otherwise going to be a very, very costly and error-prone and tedious conversion process to make. So the lessons to be learned there is that patterns and frameworks help us adapt gracefully when the inevitable unexpected happens.